Welcome to Litigation Nation. I'm your host, Jack Sanker. Today's stories. How much farmland in the United States is owned by foreign corporations from places like China and Russia? No one actually knows. Another COVID case out of California, a ruling that further opens the door for COVID tort claims maybe becoming more common. And Chinese scientists have developed an AI prosecutor that could theoretically develop and even press charges. All of that and more. Here's what you need to know. Foreign companies are buying up acres and acres of American farmlands. This is also from Investigate Midwest. Apparently, there's no reliable federal or state database that easily shows the ownership of American farmlands, specifically whether the farmland is owned by overseas corporations or foreign holders. And before I go further, I do want to be clear, the thrust of the story isn't antagonism towards foreigners or immigrants or minorities owning American farms. That's all fine and good. The issue is whether Chinese or Russian or Saudi or any number of America's geopolitical rivals whose governments often act through their private companies having a foothold in controlling domestic American food production and whether that presents a national security threat, especially as conflict with those countries heat up, just so everyone knows. So going back to investigate Midwest, quote, we should know based on whether it's a national security issue, a food security issue, who's going to be the next generation of farmers and feed our neighbors, said farmer and former Missouri Democrat Lieutenant Governor Joe Maxwell. We should know who's buying up America's farmland and for what purpose they're doing it, unquote. Quoting more from the story, despite a federal law requiring foreign transactions of agricultural land be reported and recorded to the federal government, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's database appears to be missing significant acres of land. Records of who owns what don't match. Reconciling federal, state, and county records of land ownership is all but impossible. It is unclear whether the discrepancies originate from the company's reporting, the forms that the USDA records, or how these records are being maintained at the state level. If we don't have accurate information on who holds the title or who holds the deed, then we're no longer even upholding the basic system of property rights in the United States, said Laura Ashwood, a professor at the University of Kentucky who studies agricultural policy and rural trends, unquote. The story has a lot of great interactive graphics and maps. I encourage everyone to check it out. One in particular shows the amount of foreign land owned by percentage per state. Here's some highlights. In Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, Michigan, and the entire South below North Carolina, foreign holdings make up greater than 2% of all farmland. So the issue is that records of these property acquisitions are kept via a hodgepodge of state agencies, federal agencies. Many states, their records don't even match the federal records that are supposed to be submitted. Put another way, there's no easy way for regulators to quickly understand how much farmland, which can also include access to natural resources, water, etc., is being bought up by foreign entities that may, in the near future, frankly, have some geopolitical conflict with the United States. So you could see how this would become a problem in the near future, especially as conflicts ramp up with places like Russia and perhaps China down the line. There's a great book on this called The Scientist and the Spy, A True Story of China, the FBI and Industrial Espionage, by the way, by author Mara Hisfindahl. I do recommend it. It's, it's a great read. I think it's important that U.S. regulators be able to understand who owns what in terms of our natural resources, and I think that most people would agree. The California Court of Appeals just handed down an interesting decision on December 21st. Seize Candy, a California-based candy company that's owned by Berkshire Hathaway, is involved in a wrongful death lawsuit whereby a Seize employee alleges she contracted COVID in the workplace, then came home, exposed her husband to COVID, who then subsequently died of COVID. The employee of Seize, along with the surviving children, then sued Seize for wrongful death, Seas moved to dismiss pursuant to the exclusive remedy provision of California's Workers' Compensation Act. And for those of you that aren't familiar, the exclusive remedy provision is pretty consistent from state to state where there is a Workers' Compensation Act. Basically, when states have established a work comp system for workplace injuries, an injured worker can only go through that system for compensation and cannot sue their employer in a traditional tort lawsuit. Therefore, their exclusive remedy is the workers' comp system. Basically, it's meant to be a shield to employers to the excess pain and suffering verdicts that are 
common in many states in exchange for what is supposed to be a quick and equitable compensation for the injured worker. Whether you think that your state's Workers' Compensation Act accomplishes this, I'm sure many lawyers' opinions will differ. C's argued that their employee's wrongful death claim is barred by the exclusive remedy, and the California court ruled that it does not apply. I'm not going to get too far into the reasoning because that's a matter of interpretation of California state law, and I'm not about to pretend to be an expert in that. However, I will highlight that this ruling is another step in the direction of viable tort claims for exposure to COVID. And in this case, California for now is recognizing a potential secondhand exposure claim. Remember, in this case, the employee came home, gave it to her husband, who later died about a month later. And that's not exactly unheard of. For example, in the asbestos context, there are many cases involving spouses getting exposed by virtue of living of the worker who was exposed to asbestos on the job. And the reasoning seems to be similar to those cases here. And granted, the subject of this appeal didn't seem to address the issues of causation, but it does point to the direction of the court imposing strict duties on employers or job sites or premises owners, even in the early months of the pandemic, since the plaintiff in this case alleges the exposure occurred on or about March 22nd of 2020. So for those of you that want to look this up, it's docket number 20 STCV4973 in the Superior Court of California. We'll be sure to let you know if anything interesting develops going forward. The South China Morning Post, a widely read Chinese newspaper that is also published in English as well, reported just before the new year that Chinese researchers had developed a, quote, AI prosecutor that can reportedly identify crimes and press charges with 97% accuracy, according to the Post. Apparently, the AI was fed data on 17,000 criminal cases from 2015 through 2020 and can identify with accuracy certain crimes like gambling, reckless driving, theft, and fraud, and then can recommend sentences for them. It is currently in the midst of a pilot program that's being run in Shanghai. Researchers say the technology can be used to reduce prosecutors' daily workload, allowing them to focus on more difficult cases, according to Professor Shi Yang, director of the Chinese Academy of Sciences Big Data and Knowledge Laboratory. Apparently, this technology builds on existing protocols and technology that's already in use in China, including an AI tool called System 206, which analyzes the strength of evidence and the likelihood of potential future crimes. According to Professor Yang, existing AI tools, quote, do not participate in the decision-making process of filing charges and suggesting sentences, unquote. Presumably what sets the new AI technology apart is that it would participate in the decision-making process. It's not quite clear from the report. Now, from the article in the South China Morning Post, I'm actually not sure if the AI is literally filing charges itself or if it is recommending charges to a human prosecutor who then can simply submit the recommended filings from the AI. I don't know if there's a human intermediary or if the prosecutor is literally just a computer program here. A prosecutor in Guangzhou was quoted in the piece as being skeptical, saying, quote, the accuracy of 97% may be high from a technological point of view, but there will always be chance of mistake, unquote, said the prosecutor who wished to remain anonymous. He said, quote, who will take responsibility when it happens, the prosecutor, the machine, or the designer of the algorithm, unquote. And I've seen that same question being asked for self-driving cars here in the United States, actually. So all of this sounds kind of minority reporting, right? What's interesting is that when looking into this while writing for the week's show, I found that many criminal systems in the United States utilize similar programs, although on a much lesser degree. And forgive me if this isn't news to any of you criminal lawyers out there. I'm merely a civil litigator. Uh, I knew generally of the existence of actuaries, like the public safety assessment, which I guess is a statistical model that can predict things like failure to appear for a pretrial, potential future arrests, things like that based on social modeling. And the PSA is used by judges all over the country, in fact. However, I did not know about Compass, which is an 
algorithm that seeks to assess a criminal defendant's likelihood of becoming a recidivist, i.e. a re-offender. From a ProPublica report in 2016, it found that COMPASS, which stands for Correctional Officer Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions, when addressing black defendants, quote, were far more likely than white defendants to be incorrectly judged at a higher risk of recidivism, while white defendants were, were more likely than black defendants to be incorrectly flagged low risk, unquote. Regarding the accuracy of Compass, quote, in forecasting who would correctly reoffend, the algorithm correctly predicted recidivism for black and white defendants at roughly the same rate, 59% for white defendants and 63% for black defendants, but made mistakes in very different ways, unquote. This story is really great because I don't know, it's kind of easier to accept, at least for me, that places like China may be outsourcing key elements of their justice system to computers. And that's why this story grabbed a ton of headlines over the past two weeks here in the United States. But, and I'm no expert, but when you look into it further, things like the Compass program and PSA that exist in the United States are not that dissimilar in design, even though we have not automated the role of prosecutor the way that China seems to be experimenting with. Nonetheless, the differences seem to be in degree, not in kind. Both countries likely are looking at a backlog of criminal cases and thinking, how can we use our amazing technological advances to automate at least some part of this process? And I guess who can blame them? We hear stories all the time of clogged courts and congested criminal dockets. Still, it does at least register on my personal future dystopia detector as a Verity Minority Report S type of step towards an automated criminal justice system. If anyone has an experience with Compass or PSA, feel free to reach out and let us know in the comments. I'd be interested in hearing from you. Thanks, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the show. Let us know what you think so far. We really mean it. We want to know what you like or dislike about the show. Let us know if you think there's something we should be covering that we're not. We do our best to keep our ear to the ground, but obviously keeping up with our day jobs mean we miss some things. Remember, you can find us everywhere now, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, Google Play, etc. Drop a rating or review on those platforms to help us beat the algorithm and show up in search results. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.